Welcome to the Gadsden Art Center and Museum and the exhibition from the Cedar Chest Southern Quilting 1830s to today. We're so excited to present this exhibition to you, which includes 31 quilts from local collectors and museums in the Big Bend region. This audio tour will provide a brief introduction and walk you through several quilts in the exhibition. We'll start here in the lobby with an introduction and a discussion of a few quilts here before moving into the main gallery. So what's a quilt? A quilt is such a simple utilitarian thing, a bed covering from a private space in your home. It's typically made by a family member or friend and quilts are deeply personal, they're special and beloved. Whether hand or machine stitched, they are guided by the care and precision of a skilled craftsperson who is often a woman that quilted as part of taking care of her family, a way to keep the family warm at night. Everything they did, if, if you look back, everything they did was to uplift the family. During the summer months, they canned. Uh, in the winter months, they sewed. And they were there was always something to be done around the house to make life better for your family. That's Alice Dupont who loaned us the last quilt her mother made for her before she passed away. We collected several interviews for this exhibition to hear the stories firsthand from those loaning us quilts. Many of these families have a long history of quilting. This is something that's been a part of our family for a long, long time. Nick Adams, his brother Bill Adams, and sister Kay Adams shared how their family, the Nicholsons, were part of the founding of Gaston County. The Nicholsons were part of the surveying team that laid out the city of Quincy, which was 1823. So you'll notice that our exhibition is from the Cedar Chest Southern Quilting 1830s to today. And the key reason for that is that we focused on after 1830 because Gadsden County was founded in 1823. Before then, this area was mostly uninhabited wilderness. Additionally, because quilts were utilitarian, over time they simply would deteriorate. However, some were saved, in large part due to the treasured cedar chest or hope chest. Women often use cedar chests like the ones we have here in the lobby to store their precious items, especially quilts, as the red cedar fumes kept out moths. Quilts were necessary to keep the family warm, but the beauty of the designs was solely from the women who created them. And in the 31 quilts in our exhibition, all known creators are women. Whether blocks, tessellations, crazy quilts, patchwork quilts, or story quilts, each is unique due to the infinite possibilities of the patterns, colors, and fabrics. In the lobby here, we have several different styles. The medallion quilt on the left side of the lobby is a large white quilt with a central floral scene and floral patterns in all four corners, in bright reds, yellows, and greens. Medallion quilts feature a central motif, which, like this quilt, are typically appliqued. And to applique is to take cut pieces of fabric and stitch them on top of another larger piece. Medallion quilts were a tradition brought over from Europe and most popular format until about the 1830s. But let's take a step back. What is a quilt technically? It's a front, the decorative piece, a back, uh, padding or binding in the middle, and those are all stitched together or quilted together. Early quilts didn't have these decorative fronts, but rather created the designs out of the actual quilting itself. And I'll actually point out one particular quilt in this exhibit that does that later. Back to these works in the lobby here. To the left of the medallion quilt, we have a mother's garden pattern, which was created by Mary Knight Roberts. This quilt is an example of a tessellation or a way of making a design out of identical interlocking shapes. In this case, the hexagons fit together like the pentagons on a soccer ball. And with the mother's garden pattern, the quilter works outward from that central hexagon, adding some colored hexagons around that first one, and then repeating that process until she reaches that path. And in this case, that's these dark green shapes that seem to create a path through the, a garden of flowers. This quilt is so intricate, and it has approximately 2,000 small hexagons to create a larger pattern. Here is the creator, Mary Knight Roberts, talking about her choices of fabrics. The most of mine I got from uh, closing old dresses, you know, you didn't buy much fabric back then. If a dress, you know, you get tired of wearing a dress, you cut it up, you make a quilt. Jeans, you take those jeans when you get tired of wearing them and you cut them up and make a quilt. So that's what we would do. And most of my quilting now is from 
uh, I used to sew a lot, um, make clothes for different, you know, people. And that's what I'm using now is the pieces from those dresses that I used to make for my children and other people. So that's what I'm putting into the quilts that I'm making now. I'm not really buying fabric. I'm just putting stuff in them that I already have. But all of it is new fabric. It's new fabric, but it's just pieces that you can't use for anything else. Mary's daughter, Betty James, remembers spotting all her clothing in her mother's quilts, too. I would pick up from is all of the fabrics that were left over from all of the dresses and the, uh, even the people who gave us clothing and all. You saw them. You could point out the different patterns and the shirts and that's my dress those are my you know that's my shirt and you could pick that out in the in the quilts in many quilts in this exhibition you'll find pieces of fabric that are scraps left over from making the family's clothing the last piece in the lobby that i'll talk about is to the left of the mother's garden quilt this quilt features 25 blocks with yellow fabric between each block and on the borders unlike most block patterns each of the 25 blocks has a unique handkerchief stitched onto it. The quilt was created by Patricia Spooner with handkerchiefs she had been holding onto for years from her grandmother and great-grandmother. After seeing the idea on Pinterest, Patricia thought, Well, I can surely do that. <laughs> and that would be a good way to pass the quilt on because no one wants just a sack full of handkerchiefs. But if you have a quilt they'll be wanting it. So to me, that just seemed like the, the best way to use them, to keep them in the family and to keep them passing on, you know. To Patricia, quilts are not just for warmth, they're also a piece of her history. If you do something with it and you pass it to someone, you know, then they get invested in, the, in your family history. They, they get invested in their family history, which is important. And while some quilters are extremely careful with their quilts and keep them mostly stored, Patricia thinks the specialness of quilts is in their use, the way the fabric feels after years of use and the reminder of family from the fabrics in the quilt. For that reason, she hopes that her quilts will be regularly used. Once it's folded and put away, you're not gonna ever think of those people. This is a visual reminder of what your history is. Let's head into the main gallery for a closer look at more quilts in the exhibition. Quilts can tell so many stories. Stacy Hollander, while curator at the American Folk Art Museum, said examining a quilt is like reading a historical document. The quilt tells the story of a time and the story of a life and sometimes multiple lives. Quilting traditions span centuries, generations, and cultures. When you first walk into the main gallery, to the left, you'll find the oldest quilts in the exhibition. These are two crib quilts from the early 1800s. Both flying geese or a wild goose chase pattern is created from an assemblage of triangles. Now, in case you are curious, quilts are technically supposed to be all stitched together in what is often called the quilt sandwich, with that top, batting in the middle, and back. A few quilts defy these conventions, such as the sawtooth baby quilt from Goodwood Museum and Gardens, which, instead of being stitched together, is hand-tied together at the meeting of the red and beige triangles. If we jump forward about 50 years and move down this same wall, you'll find two quilts of very different styles, both designs from the 1880s. First, you'll find a crazy quilt. This exquisite quilt was hand-pieced, hand-embroidered, and hand-quilted, all here in Quincy, Florida. Crazy Quilts really grew in popularity after the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, which featured a Japanese pavilion, and at that time about one-fifth of Americans attended the event, and it was many of people's first exposure to Japanese art and culture here in America. Following that event, upper-class white women began creating decorative crazy quilts out of expensive fabric such as silk and velvet with intricate embroidered stitches and applique designs inspired by Japanese art and culture. This Victorian crazy quilt from 1885 even features a Japanese pagoda and fan, in addition to an elephant, an alligator, interlocked circles, flowers, a cow jumping over the moon, and more. 
There is actually another crazy quilt in the center of the gallery that features some of the same imagery, including a cross tombstone, those interlocking circles, and a very similar alligator that looks a lot like a dinosaur. As it turns out, Lucy Fitzgerald Jones Shepard, who created this quilt, was related to Martha Harriet Jones, one of the women who created the other quilt just down the road. To the right of this crazy quilt is the only quilt design from the 1800s made by an African-American woman that we know of. Though this actual quilt dates to the 1990s, the original design and pattern was created by Harriet Powers in 1886. After emancipation, Harriet lived in Georgia and created this biblical quilt, and it's completely unlike anything else that was popular at the time. She exhibited it at the Athens Cotton Fair, where an artist became really interested in it and interested in purchasing it, but Harriet wouldn't sell. A few years later, at the urging of her husband and, and due to some hard times, Harriet sold the quilt for $5 to the artist, Jenny Smith, who took intricate notes on all the different scenes in the composition. Later, the quilt became a part of the Smithsonian's collection where the original still remains. And over time, the pattern has really grown in popularity and many replicas have been made, like this one from the 1990s much like the way quilters share and adopt block patterns. The original quilt also didn't have the top and bottom uh, to fit a bed and was more of an art piece than a blanket, much like these decorative crazy quilts that are being made at the same time. Starting at the top left, the scenes depicted are Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then a continuance of paradise with Eve and the sun, and the final image on that top row is Satan amidst seven stars. On the next row, there's Cain killing his brother Abel, then Cain going to the land of Nod to get a wife, Jacob's dream with the ladder, and the baptism of Christ. And the final row depicts a crucifixion, Judas, and the 30 pieces of silver, the Last Supper, and finally the Holy Family. Historically, quilt making has been often dismissed as women's work because it's utilitarian, it has been distanced from fine art, and yet scholars today are saying that women quilt makers were some of the first abstract artists in America. The design basics of quilts can be found in many popular contemporary male painters' works, such as grid layouts like in Andy Warhol's works, log cabin type patterns like um, Joseph Albert's, and even in entire quilts such as uh, Rauschenberg. Even though popular patterns began to be shared in magazines and repeated over and over by friends and family, each quilt is unique due to the fabric choices, patterns, and variations on patterns. They're both utilitarian and a work of art. Let's take, for example, uh, the work in the front right side of the gallery by Christine Dupont. This 1970s quilt is a variation on a star and a mosaic, incorporating a very difficult pattern of triangles and squares of various sizes. Christine took leftover children's clothing fabric scraps and turned them into something both beautiful and purposeful. Uh, this is her daughter, Alice Dupont, describing her mother's quilting. Quilting in our family was as quilting was in most families uh, in the late 40s, 50s, and 60s, quilting was done mainly in the winter when women would come together and bring their, they called them scraps. And scraps were old shirts that their children wore or their wore or their husbands wore, but they could no longer be worn as full garments. So they would take, uh, they would get together a weekly, most of them on a weekly basis, maybe any place from five to ten women, and they would bring the shirts, the pants, the children's clothing, and they would sit there and cut the part of the fabric that was still usable. And say, for instance, I was making a quilt that was going to be multicolored, and you had a part of the quilt but you needed just a little color or you needed a strip to go around to tie the quilt together and I would share with you parts of my quilt if I needed a, a block then you would share with me part of your quilt that matched what I already had you found a piece of your dress a, a piece of your sister's dress a piece of your brother's shirt and so it was usually a garment made from shirts that were too small 
or old. They had been torn through use. And uh, the mother or the aunt or the grandmother would cut them in small pieces and then they would use those pieces to make patterns. And they would gather once a week during the winter months at each other's homes. And they, oh, I like that dress. Can I have a piece? So you would give your friend, your cousin, your neighbor a piece of the skirt. And so it was a way to keep the history of the family going. This quilt is particularly special for Alice. This quilt is important to me because it's the last quilt that my mother made. And she made me a quilt, my two sisters a quilt. So there were three quilts. And we didn't realize it, but she knew that she was dying. And I have never used this quilt. And I don't think that they have either. But um, this one, I remember it being on my bed in the wintertime. But uh, she she knew that she was dying. In fact, the, I found out that the doctor had already informed her of this. And um, this was her gift, because she sewed every stitch by hand. Like the quilt made by Christine Dupont, many quilts in this exhibition were hand quilted. Sewing machines, which were often used for stitching together the blocks, simply couldn't handle the multiple layers and pure scale of a quilt. Uh, one of, if not the most popular pattern in all of quilting is the log cabin. It's created out of strips of fabric, this seemingly simple pattern actually has nearly endless possibilities. Uh, to the left of Christine Dupont's quilt, we have a modern log cabin quilt from the 1990s by Frances Dickinson Spillers that features a wide array of fabrics in a very fun take on the design. Often log cabins would feature this red square in the middle, kind of echoing the idea of a hearth at the center of a log cabin. But in her quilt, Frances decided instead to feature these small vignettes of window scenes. We got lace fabrics becoming curtains with things like a Halloween pumpkin and a puppy for sale and a kitten for sale and haircuts for just 75 cents. In one of the display cases, you'll find another log cabin from the collection of Goodwood Museum and Gardens. And then towards the back of the gallery, we have a courthouse steps pattern, which is a variation on the log cabin and inspired our own quilt mural in the front window of the museum. Towards the center of the gallery, hanging from the ceiling, you'll find a beautiful tulip quilt created by Marjorie Cox Smith. Tulip patterns were popular for many, many years, but often featured a specific five-pointed geometrical petal. This particular tulip variation was passed down through three generations, from all of Betts Mitchell to Augusta Mitchell Cox, and then to Marjorie Cox Smith, who hand-stitched and hand-quilted this quilt in 2017. Because of the empty white blocks surrounding the tulips, this quilt is a great example for hand quilting. Notice that the quilt stitches appear to form their own log cabin pattern. This is really a quilt I encourage you to look at very closely. Moving further towards the back of the gallery, we have a sunbonnet suit pattern that dates to the 1930s, followed by a rose wreath from around that same time, both very popular patterns. And then the next quilt on this wall is from the 1950s and highlights a practice that many quilters used in this period, the use of flour and feed sacks to create clothing and quilts. Beginning in the Great Depression, many families would use the sacks because the striped and later floral patterns were perfect for clothing. And though it was considered thrifty, it was also a marketing tactic from the companies who sold those cotton sacks, promising a second use for them. As Nick Adams says, Like I say, it was done mostly as a matter of necessity, and you used what materials you had. Uh, flower sack quilts weren't made to be cute or in vogue or in style. They were made using flower sack quilts because that's the way the flower came and you used what you had. For the process, Nick describes the way they worked together to quilt. So they would hang them up like on a clothesline and people would sit and sew, you know, and we'd do years this month and years this month and, and that's what they did when they got together. This particular quilt top was created by Ellie Darcy Nicholson and Sarah Nicholson Adams. Nick Adams, son of Sarah Nicholson Adams, says, Quilting has been and is part of the fabric of our life. 
and the pun intended. Uh, it's, it's been a necessity, it's been a convenience. It was not done out of art for art's sake. It was done out of using what you had and, and putting it all together and for your own comfort and survival. Uh, it, uh, it was a basic part of life for a long, long time for my grandparents, for my parents. and I mean, I've, I still use quilts. I prefer them to a blanket any day. Also from the collection of the Adams Family is a patchwork quilt design created by Bill Adams' nanny as a small child, a woman named Pearl who worked on their farm home in San Julia Farm. You can find that one across the gallery next to a modern crazy quilt, also from the Adams Family, created by Sarah Nicholson Adams. So what, what is a quilt? It's history, home, art, tradition, pattern, warmth, and family. What does quilting mean to you and your family? Warm feet. Warm feet. Heavy fabric. That whole quilt was made by hand. Every stitch was done by hand. And so it was a necessity, but it was also a way to preserve the history so I just enjoy quilting, and, it's, and I am hoping that uh, somewhere down the road that some of the children or grandchildren will take up quilting and just, uh, you know, carry on the legacy so that, you know, there'll always be quilts in the family uh, from different generations. I think um, it's important to know uh, that um, the beginning and where quilts uh, derived and, and, and it was not so much the beauty and the artistic format of it but it was about survival and about just making sure your family had what they needed to keep warm and it developed over the years but at the same time you want the student the children to know that uh, while it's uh, a great way to um, have something in your family to treasure. It's also a great way to carry on a family legacy and a family heirloom and, and knowing the joy that went into it uh, when, when your family was before you were born. Uh, and not only was it joy uh, for, uh, for your family, but it was also to understand that families knew how to survive. I truly think that quilts are made to be used because when you look at a new one and you think, wow, how pretty it is, but then 50 years down the road after it's been washed 50 times or more and you look at it again, doesn't it have just, it has this patina to it, this warmness and the softness to it that just really enthralled me. I just, I, I love a quilt, and I love a quilt that's used. Quilting traditions span centuries, generations, and cultures. Quilts are first and foremost an art of touch and embrace us at all stages of life. They're communal objects about sharing, inclusiveness, made for families, for causes, and for celebrations. Almost everyone has a quilt story, and we hope you'll share yours. We have a quilt blog at quilts.gadstonarts.org where you can share your quilt story, upload photos, and there's also some iPads in the galleries where you can share those stories and take a survey about the exhibition. Something else you can find at quilts.gadstonarts.org is the Big Bend Quilt Trail. From Chattahoochee through Greensboro, Quincy, and all the way through Tallahassee, there are these quilt block designs turned into murals that you can find on some community organizations in our area. So we hope you'll check out that website, again, quilts.gadstonarts.org, to learn a little bit more about the Big Bend Quilt Trail. We hope you've enjoyed this audio tour from the Cedar Chest. Uh, because quilts are an art of touch and you can't touch what's on display, we have created a touch station towards the back of the gallery. Please be gentle when touching the fabrics, uh, but you'll find examples of batting, different quilt designs, and fabrics.